We're looking at wait times for patients to see an ophthalmologist for the first time, for me, would be a surrogate as to how we're coping with the demand for our services. Welcome to ICAN, a podcast about ophthalmology through a uniquely Canadian lens with Dr. Mona Dagger and myself, Dr. Hadi Saheb. Bienvenue à ICAN, un balado sur l'ophtalmologie sous un angle typiquement canadien avec le Dr. Hadi Saheb et moi-même, Dr. Mona Dagger. Season 4 of the ICAN podcast is brought to you by Bayer Ophthalmology. We thank them for their support. Nous aimerions remercier Bayer Ophthalmology pour leur support de la quatrième saison du balado ICANN. We will share our experiences as ophthalmologists today and tackle some of the challenges we face as healthcare providers. Hey there, eye care enthusiasts. It's Mona and... Hattie, back at it again with ICANN. You know it, Hattie. Today's episode is going to be a real eye-opener. Pun intended. Mona, Mona, always with the puns. I promise, folks, today's discussion will be just as sharp as Mona's great wit. Hey, we're here to keep it both informative and entertaining, right? Absolutely. So whether you're a seasoned ophthalmologist or just as fascinated by eyes as we are, you're in for a treat. Hey, everyone. We've got a special treat for you tonight. Our former host, Dr. Gear Morosha, is joining us as a guest host. We're thrilled to have him back on the podcast, and it's like old times again. Guillermo, welcome back. We're so excited that you agreed to join us for this episode. It's going to be a fantastic night of conversation and insights. Let's dive right in and make it a memorable one. Hi, Mona. It's a pleasure to be back on the ICANN podcast. It's a little bit of a trip down memory lane, and uh, I'm really looking forward to this episode which proves to be a little bit of a paradigm shift on uh, what we're currently seeing in retina and uh, retinal diseases. On this episode of ICANN, we discuss the upcoming challenges in retina, specifically concerns about capacity with Dr. Shahir Abubaker, a retina specialist in Toronto. Dr. Shahir Abubaker is a fellowship-trained retina surgeon, having completed a two-year vitreoretinal fellowship at the University of Toronto. He obtained his medical degree at the University KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa and completed his residency at the prestigious University of Cape Town. While at the University of Cape Town, Dr. Abu Baker was awarded the Ophthalmological Society Medal for an Academic Achievement by the Fellowship Ophthalmologists of South Africa. He joined the world-renowned team at the Toronto Retina Institute in 2018. Dr. Abu Baker's academic and research interests include advancements in technology and innovative treatment options. He's also a sub investigator in numerous ongoing industry trials. He has published several peer reviewed journal articles and has presented at both local and national meetings. He also established the TRI Journal Club. Dr. Abu Baker's passion for education and philanthropy led him to co-found the Young Professionals Bursary, a scholarship aimed at assisting disadvantaged students in South Africa. With the recent approval of the first FDA-approved treatment for geographic atrophy in the United States, we have invited Dr. Abu Baker to discuss the upcoming potentials of this new treatment, as well as the challenges this may create in the Canadian context. He is involved in multiple phase three clinical trials and has presented at local and national meetings. Shahir, thank you for joining us and welcome to ICANN. Hi Mona, it's a pleasure to be here tonight and thank you so much for having me. I look forward to discussing some of the challenges that we will be facing in the near future. Today, we're diving into a crucial topic within our specialty, capacity building and future planning in light of emerging treatments. Shahir, I want to kick off our conversation with this question. What does capacity building mean to you and how do you see it shaping the future, especially with the anticipation of new treatments on the horizon? Thank you, Mona and Guillermo. So I'm by no means a systems expert, but the way I see it, there are a few ways that we can look at capacity as it relates to healthcare delivery. The major parts of this obviously are the infrastructural capacity as well as human resources. The infrastructure, of course, would be the hospitals and clinics and offices that from which we deliver our necessary, necessary care. Thankfully for ophthalmology, we aren't limited to delivering this care purely in, in hospitals. 
the ability of physicians in their own offices to add additional infrastructural capacity to our system. Hospitals up until fairly recently have been at the control of, of the government. But our challenge in, means ensuring that our infrastructural capacity is built in tandem with increasing our human resources to meet the growing needs of our population. Um, as far as human resources and individual capacity are concerned, the sad truth, Mona, is that both you and I are limited in the amount of care that we're able to deliver. We're essentially in the business of service delivery, which is inherent in the very nature of our, of our profession. This service delivery for each and every one of us is time limited. We each have our own inherent capacity, which we add to the system every day. The low hanging fruit here, of course, is, well, let's just train more ophthalmologists here. And yes, that's definitely part of the solution, but it's only one part. And the challenges upcoming are likely going to need to be tackled from multiple angles. One such angle as it relates to service delivery is to ensure that we as physicians are practicing as efficiently as possible. Now, of course, this does come with the note of caution as practitioner eff efficiency and patient care can sometimes exist on the opposite ends of the same pendulum. We do need to ensure that while we do practice efficiently, we aren't compromising care. How we strike that balance is really going to be at the judgment of each individual physician. And I'm certainly not advocating for all of us to be seeing hundreds of patients every day, but ensuring that the time that we do spend with each patient is meaningful and that we have the information we require when we need it and to spend the time when we need it, which is in examining our patients, making the correct clinical decisions and communicating these, these decisions effectively with our patients. How are we doing capacity wise with the current workload managing all these patients? Yeah, that's, that's a great question, Guillermo. And sometimes it can be a little difficult to sort of calculate or ascertain exactly how we're doing capacity wise. I guess the easiest way to do that really would be to look at the billing codes to sort of understand what our current capacity is. But, you know, I think a better way to sort of plan uh, would be sort of to look at um, the demand and trying to understand the demand, which may be more difficult and tougher to quantify. Um, you know, we're looking at wait times uh, for patients to see an ophthalmologist for the first time, uh, for me, would be a surrogate as to how we're coping with the demand for our services. Uh, you know, each province also would have uh, different, different needs uh, and different challenges uh, relating to this, with some territories and provinces obviously being more remote than others, with a potentially smaller relative amount of ophthalmologists serving their needs. Uh, this changes, of course, when you look at larger urban centers as well as suburban areas surrounding that. Um, historically, the majority of retinal care in urban and suburb suburban areas close to large centers like Toronto or Montreal or Vancouver have been provided more by retina specialists, whereas the communities outside of these areas have been very well served by our excellent comprehensive colleagues. For retina specialists, of course, these are our bread and butter. These are our every day and these fill up our clinics regularly. But for our comprehensive colleagues, retinal care is not their entirety of their practice. The anti vegf burden may be reducing their ability to deliver care in other areas of ophthalmology as per their community needs. Upcoming treatments may further sway that picture more towards retina. Ultimately, without any growth in current capacity, this may have unintended effects on other areas of the specialty that deserve attention. Another metric we could look at is the number of ophthalmologists per 100,000. Um, and Dr. Yvonne Baez recently published an excellent paper looking at this that was published in the CGO of June of 2022. She reported that there was a total of 1,323 ophthalmologists registered in Canada as of 2020. Uh, I don't know if that data was pre or post COVID because we know obviously there was a lot of uh, retirees post or during COVID. Um, and that gave us an overall number of 3.48 ophthalmologists per 100,000 population. This number unfortunately is down from 3.7 per 100,000 in 1995. These numbers also vary by province uh, as I alluded to with Manitoba as low as 2.32 per 100,000 and Nova Scotia doing well at five ophthalmologists per 100,000 population. There are multiple reasons for this, of course, the most obvious being our population growth. This is driven by our patients living longer as we continue to advance healthcare. Life expectancy globally has increased from 65 years of age in 2005 to 73 years of age in 2024. And Canada has done even better than the global average with a life expectancy of 83 years as of 2024, a sign perhaps of a high floor of healthcare and excellent access to care. Um, that has been delivered with a solid foundation over the healthcare that's been developed over the last 30 years. But essentially, 
Uh, this may suggest that we've not been keeping up with our trainee numbers to meet the demands of the population. The other metric that we would use would be to look, as I said, of wait times for new patients. I don't have any national or provincial data on this, but we have heard anecdotally from our referral base that there has been difficulty in getting these patients seen timelessly in certain areas. And in some instances, patients are waiting up to six months. We've also heard that certain hospitals and clinics have had to turn down new referrals or close their door to these as they cannot cope with the current volumes. This in and of itself points to a system that is at, close to, or potentially exceeding its capacity. And if we don't make changes now, we may all end up with a bigger problem on our plates. Thank you so much for, uh, for that response, uh, Shahir. Um, now we're facing an even greater challenge. Up to this point, we really had no uh, formal treatments for, uh, for modifying the disease course of geographic atrophy. So could you give us an overview of some of the challenges we saw with the um, with uh, VGF uh, era, maybe going back a little bit in time, and then what other challenges we're going to face as we begin to explore new treatments now for geographic atrophy? Yes, thanks for that, Guillermo. So as we all know, the anti-VEGF era began uh, around 2011 with the introduction of bevacizumab into the market in Canada. And we were suddenly able to go from a condition that was blinding with no treatment to being able to preserve pa uh, vision in patients who had previously gone, gone blind before our eyes. I think our system then had more inherent capacity than what we have now, unfortunately. Uh, and a part of this reason was that the demands of medical retina at the time, pre bevacizumab were moderate enough that the majority of retinal care was mostly delivered by on our senior colleagues and mentors 13 years ago, who were surgically trained and essentially practiced both medical and surgical retina. Now we go into the potential for dry AMD therapies, as you said, carrying that burden of the wet AMD population. And that burden itself is growing. Uh, this is as a result of the prevalence of AMD, as well as the aging population, increasing life expectancy and the so-called silver tsunami that we're facing. The percentage of the Canadian population that is 65 years and older has increased from 14.8% in 2012 to 19% in 2022. This has led to an estimated more than 630,000 anti-VEGF injections performed Canada-wide for AMD alone in 2018. This was published in 2020 COS Impact paper. This number is projected to increase to 975,000 by 2040. And this number is for AMD alone. This doesn't take into account the diabetic macular edema patients and injections that are performed, as well as the vein occlusion uh, injections with anti vegetative therapy uh, that we perform on a daily basis. Incredible. And what does um, dry macular degeneration treatment play in the broader landscape? Yeah, Mona, I think the analogy that applies best here is that of an iceberg. You know, approximately 10% of an iceberg is visible above the water, and the approximate incidence of wet AMD is about 10% of the total AMD population. So if you think about it, you know, we've really only been treating the tip of the iceberg up until now. And as we enter into this potential treatment, we could be potentially treating the remaining 90%. Now, having said that, I'm not necessarily suggesting that, you know, we would instantly be treating all of the patients with dry AMD, but the potential may be there. Um, and those numbers are very large. The estimated prevalence of AMD in Canada is about two and a half million with an incidence of around 1.68, which was published in a 2021 paper in the CJO. And we've already alluded to the fact that the population is aging quickly and healthily. Having said that, we still get a lot to learn about dry AMD and GA progression. There's a lot of discussion at our meetings about, you know, the definitions of start points of atrophy as well as the end points of atrophy. What are we using uh, as, as, as points to measure this? Um, and we're still learning a lot about the natural history as it re refers to the growth rates of atrophy and the factors that would suggest or the biomarkers that would suggest faster progression. Uh, biomarkers such as multifocality of the lesions, larger baseline lesion size, as well as extrapoveal areas of the atrophy. There's no current consensus on the best modality of imaging for monitoring these patients. Uh, there's a lot of discussion as to whether OCT or fundus autofluorescence is perhaps the best way to assess uh, atrophy progression, both from a research context as well as a clinical context. 
We also don't yet know or have not yet determined criteria for which patients we should be initially starting on this treatment. Are we treating everybody with dry AMD? Are we only going to start with treating early AMD, intermediate AMD? Or do, is it best to wait for the first signs of atrophy before we start the treatment? Those signs of atrophy, is that IRORA, is that CRORA, or is it nascent GA? These are all the things that we still don't know. Are we including or excluding subfoveal GA? So there's a lot that we don't know yet to help guide our decision making. And so I think there's a lot of discussion and learning and experience that we still need to go through uh, to fully understand how best we can use these new agents. ICANN wants to know what you think. Please send your comments on today's episode or any suggestions you may have for topics or features to communications at cos-seo.ca. And we will try to incorporate them into future episodes. I'm Vivian Hill, and I listen to the ICANN podcast. The more I, I see how our retina colleagues are working and all the different agents that are coming up, I can only imagine a bit of a of a tsunami of patients with uh, new agents and new indications. Can you give us a sense of some of the newer agents? And I'm thinking also about how do you regulate, if we're talking about capacity, how do you regulate the administration of the medication? Are there any depot medications or other modalities that may extend the the frequency of the injections, or are there combined treatments, for example, anti-VEGF, anti-complement injections, single vials, single syringe, those types of things that could make it more efficient and the need to have these injections less frequently, perhaps? Yeah, thanks, Kim. Well, that's a great question. So obviously, the first part of that question is dealing with the agents that are upcoming, and, and the two that we know of that are upcoming both work by uh, blocking the complement pathway at different points uh, in that pathway. The first FDA-approved treatment, Pexitecoplan, is a C3 inhibitor that has been shown to slow down the progress of geographic atrophy by about 39% in the monthly treatment arm and about 32% in the ev every other month treatment arm in the Phase 3B Gale study. And this was up to about 36 months. This cohort does include the phase three um, groups uh, from the Darby and Oak study who have now been extended into the Gale study. It's also important to note that these treatments aren't without risk. Aside from the endophthalmitis risk that we are now all familiar with when it comes to intravitreal injections, there was also an early streak of 10 cases of occlusive vasculitis in the, in the US with plan post-approval that have since been attributed to the 19 gauge filter needle. And this always should be giving us pause, especially since we've seen this before with new drugs post-approval. Unfortunately, this was the case with prolocizumab. It's also worth noting that the increased incidence of choroidal nevascularization with these treatments, which, is, which, which has an incidence of between 7 to 12% from the phase 3 Darby and Oak study in the treatment arm, as opposed to 3% in the placebo arm. So we're potentially simultaneously both increasing the wet AMD injection burden by trying to treat our dry AMD patients. I may be wrong here, but I don't necessarily foresee this being an instant treat-all, but a more gradual approach as we sort of learn more and understand more about these therapies. The second of these anti-complement agents, avicen captid pegol is slightly further back in development. This is a C5 inhibitor and has recently com completed its phase three clinical trial, the GATHER2 study, and is currently waiting FDA approval. The second part of your question is, is so critical to try and find ways to uh, increase efficiency uh, and sort of that also helps to build capacity within our system. Uh, I love the idea and I love the way you're thinking about the, the combined anti-VEGF, anti-complement injection, uh, especially in the setting of uh, increasing incidence of, of choroidal neovascularization. I would say at this point, watch the space, um, you know, the retina space is evolving very quickly, uh, but these are the kind of ideas and this is the kind of thinking that we need uh, to assist us in, in managing the tsunami that you uh, insinuated. I think most ophthalmologists would agree that these treatments will create an increased treatment burden on all of us. Uh, Dr. Ravi Dukran joined us recently on an episode, and he joked about the fact that we might need to triple our retina specialists to cope. What do you make of this? And I'd love to hear your thoughts on this perspective. 
How do you perceive the potential challenges posed by an increased treatment burden? Yeah, I must say I really enjoyed that episode with Ravi, um, and he's he's a great guy. Um, and and he may partially have been joking about uh, increasing uh, the the number of ophthalmologists threefold, uh, but there is an element of truth uh, in, in what he was saying. From a systems perspective, we re we really should be looking at increasing the training of ophthalmologists, uh, as well as medical and surgical retina fellows across the country, and then ensuring that we have the funding and the jobs to retain them. Job opportunity and OR access, both in ophthalmology, but also more so in retina, have long been a major barrier for young residents who have sometimes actually steered away from the subspecialty because of this. We should also be looking at increasing the residency intake. In 2017, there were about 36 Canadian residency positions for ophthalmology available. A Canadian study around the same time suggested that 45 positions would be required every year to meet the demand for ophthalmologists for the country. That number is likely higher now uh, because of the new treatments that we are discussing and, and being on the cusp of this new treatment area. So I'm curious to know, how will you be approaching the integration of dry AMD therapies in your own practice? Are there specific considerations or strategies you'll be planning to implement? I love that you're putting me on the spot on that one, Mona. Uh, it's a great question. Uh, and as I said, we don't really have the answers, but the, the short answer for that really, I guess, uh, from my side is cautiously. Uh, you know, those early string of cases that I discussed to give me some pause. Uh, I'm watching and following the safety data as it becomes available quite closely, uh, as I'm sure all of us are. The good news, though, that despite, you know, the initial spate of cases and and and, and poor outcomes, unfortunately, uh, is that we haven't really seen an ongoing uh, incidence and, and an ongoing spike of these types of cases and complications, which is somewhat reassuring. Uh, as more doses are being delivered in the U.S., that number is starting to head towards the one in 10,000, uh, which is a, a lot more reassuring than what we had initially feared uh, as these cases came to light. Um, I also have concerns about the rate of neovascularization with these agent, agents, which means that you know the best initial patient for me might be somebody who's already on anti-VEGF therapy, currently already diagnosed with wet AMD and doing fairly well vision-wise and perhaps having some areas of uh, early non-foveal atrophy. Unfortunately, patients who've seen the devastating effects of this condition, dry AMD and geographic atrophy on their family members, uh, are also likely the patients would be most motivated to initiate treatment earlier. Having said this, the conversation with our patients to explain the shift in our thinking and the preventative nature of this treatment does require an adjustment on our parts. It also requires a lengthier discussion and time in the chair with the patients explaining and helping them to understand the different goals of therapy. Um, as you might know, Mona and I are cornea specialists, so this is a, an interesting field for us. We always feel that we have to keep a really clear cornea so you guys can do your work on the retina. But uh, if, if I understood correctly, I'd like to hone back in on something you've mentioned a couple of times, and it's the increased risk of choroidal neovascularization. Um, am I understanding correctly that we're treating geographic atrophy with these new agents that are inhibiting uh, complement? But one of the potential side effects is the uh, development of choroidal neovascularization. Yes, unfortunately, that is absolutely correct. Okay. Uh, as an aside, thank you for keeping those corneas clear so that we can do uh, the <laughs> best jobs that we can do possibly. Uh, but yes, uh, those uh, side effects did come to light uh, as, as the phase two and phase three studies were, were following through. Uh, definitely a concern. Now, again, those numbers, we, we're seeing them reduce over time. Uh, the three and three year data has sort of got you know less incidence of those uh, uh, effects, but um, you know the, the 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 downside of this is that we could be increasing our wet AMD burden while trying to uh, prevent loss of vision in our dry AMD patients. And I think from from my side, you know, this is going to be an important discussion point with my patients. Um, and as I insinuated that 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 initial patients, as I'm learning and, and getting to know the drug. Uh, a wet AMD patient who's already receiving anti-VEGF uh, would mm -hmm. be my, my go-to. Uh, and then in the future, we'd love to have one that has, you know, a vial that has anti-VEGF and, and, and complement, as you suggested, uh, to, to, to deal with this if or when it developed. Okay, interesting. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. Shahir, um, can you tell us about upcoming surgical treatment options for wet AMD? Are there any exciting developments or innovations on the horizon that you're particularly find promising? I'm sure our listeners are eager to hear about them. 
Yeah, thanks, Mona. This is a very interesting area for me personally. Uh, you know, the idea of surgical treatment for wet AMD is is definitely a novel concept for us, um, and is is an area that uh, is still currently fairly early. It's in phase three trial. Uh, the first of these sort of that have come or, the, or that are that are in have come to phase three uh, is gene therapy, and uh, that agent is the uh, RGX three one four. So this therapy uses a novel adenoviral vector to transport a gene that is encoding for an anti-VEGF uh, protein or antibody to the RPE, which then produces, the RPE then produces an anti-VEGF-like protein into the vitreous, essentially turning the eye into an anti-VEGF factory. Uh, this treatment can be delivered either subretinally in the OR or supracoroidally in the office. Uh, and both of these modalities are currently being investigated. The, the benefits of this would be that it, this would allow for a more consistent level of anti-VEGF in the vitreous as opposed to the sort of spikes uh, of, of anti-VEGF that we get with our injections currently. Uh, and we've seen and we know now that retinas that remain dry do tend to do better than those who, which have uh, fluctuating fluid levels. The phase one, phase two results uh, have recently been published uh, and multiple dosing schedules were assessed uh, in these arms. Uh, of the cohorts that actually did show a meaningful protein response uh, in the vitreous and aqueous samples, uh, the mean reduction in injection frequency showed that there was a reduction between 60 to 80% of the injections required following gene therapy. The major side effect noted with this was retinal hypopigmentation in the area of the gene therapy bleb. And as such, the surgical technique has been altered to ensure the safe delivery of this treatment. Visual acuity and anatomical changes have remained cons consistent up to four years following treatment up to this stage. Another potential surgical option could be the port delivery system. This is an implant which is surgically placed into the patient's sclera in the supratemporal quadrant. This is obviously very familiar to us. Uh, this is similar to the sort of glaucoma drainage devices that our glaucoma colleagues are, are quite used to. Uh, this implant would store a reservoir of specifically formulated anti-VEGF product that would then slowly release into the posterior segment. Once again, the benefit here is that we would be achieving a steady state of anti-VEGF. Um, and in their phase two ladder study, the median time to refill of this device, which is done in office, was 15 months. The visual acuity and anatomical findings again here were comparable between the um, port delivery system groups and the ranibizumab groups. Uh, but this device has had its share of challenges. It's been a bit of a rocky road as it's sort of moved through the phases of development. Uh, there were initial high, very high rates of vitreous hemorrhage upon insertion. Uh, thankfully, an adjustment of the surgical technique has alleviated those concerns for the most part. Uh, another challenge has been the recent recall of the device due to septum dislodgement, uh, which was present within the device itself. That has since been addressed and resolved. Um, and of course, as we know with glaucoma drainage devices, there is an increased risk of endophthalmitis with any long-standing foreign body or device that's been placed in, into the eye. These interventions though may hold a key to a, a longer lasting treatment option that would definitely alleviate some treatment burden, both on the physician, the patient, but also the families, and hopefully create some capacity for us going forward. Well, you've alluded to some of the future of the treatment options for wet AMD. Uh, do you have any other um, any other comments regarding where the retina field is going in the next five years, perhaps in retinal detachment treatments, perhaps in uh, in-office procedures, perhaps, or diabetic retinopathy? Any uh, insights on that, Shahir? Yeah, great question. That's uh, time to pull out my crystal ball a little bit. But, you know, I will say um, there's, there's never really been a more exciting time to be a retina specialist. Uh, with the number of advances that we're seeing in the field right now, you know, we had a long period of time where between the aflibicept, release of aflibicept uh, and brolucizumab, there were no new drugs that were um, entering the, the market. And now all of a sudden we have multiple new agents for wet AMD and we're on the cusp of treating dry AMD as we've discussed. Ultimately though, I guess uptake of these new treatments will first and foremost rest on their safety. Um, we've seen promising drugs fall by the wayside purely on safety concerns, despite very promising efficacy data. We obviously hope that our new generation agents will deliver on their durability promise. But in five years, we may not be treating with AMD or DME with anti-VEGF agents. We may be treating them with gene therapy. Uh, whether that would be injecting supracoroidally in the office or subretinally in the OR. And if that does become the gold standard, we may have to have another, dis another discussion about OR capacity soon. Um, 
but the ability to treat high volumes of patients in the office would likely make more sense. Uh, and so an in-office approach would likely be the preferred method forward. But for dry MD, again, as I've said, there's a lot of unanswered questions. The, the dry MD pipeline is strong though. So uh, if it isn't this agent or the next, uh, there are a few coming and likely one along the way somewhere is going to offer hope to our patients uh, of a long lasting reduction in progression. I think whichever direction we go, we have really have a lot to be excited about. Wow, truly fascinating, Shair. It is uh, a lot of innovation, a lot of uh, wonderful things coming up. And thank you for sharing your insight and expertise with us. It was really fascinating to hear all that's coming up in Retina. Shair, we like to close each episode getting to know our guests' non-professional life. Um, Can you tell us more about uh, your interests outside of ophthalmology? I must admit, I've heard this before, so I was a little bit more prepared than Gamo says he was in his episode, but I know that he was well prepared as well. Um, yeah, uh, For me, uh, I'm definitely a sports guy, uh, soccer being the big sport in my life. Uh, looking forward to the 2026 World Cup and excited to see the number of games that we've got coming up for Toronto. So really looking forward to that. I'm a self-described foodie and I, I love the Toronto food scene. Uh, but most of my time now is uh, when I'm not working is uh, spent with my son. Um, and there's another little one on the way. So we're really looking forward to spending a bit more time with the family. Congratulations. Wonderful. Awesome. You'll have to get me tickets for Toronto. I love soccer too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so Definitely. much for uh, joining us in the podcast here. Thank you for having me. I can wants to know what you think. Please send your comments on today's episode or any suggestions you may have for topics or features to communications at cos-sco.ca and we will try to incorporate them into future episodes. Season 4 of the ICANN podcast is brought to you by Bayer Ophthalmology. We thank them for their support. Nous vous aimerions remercier Bayer Ophthalmology pour leur support de la quatrième saison du balado ICANN. Thank you from the Canadian Ophthalmological Society. ICANN is written and directed by Kim Teitler and produced by John Allaire from Allaire Strategic Works. ICANN is available on Apple, Spotify, and Google platforms. And of course, through the COS Practice Resource Center. Some episodes this season will include relevant links and show notes, so be sure to check episode descriptions to learn more. Thank you for joining us this week. We look forward to bringing you more episodes. 